Good morning, everyone. We begin with an acknowledgement of country. We meet on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, on land that was taken from them without consent, treaty or compensation. We acknowledge Wurundjeri elders past and present and Wurundjeri young people who hold the hope for justice for the people and for the land. Please be seated. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome here. I want to welcome those of you who are gathered here, physically present in the church, and also to welcome people who join us by watching our video on YouTube uh, that will be available this afternoon or at any time during the week that people are free to watch. To welcome anyone who's a visitor or a newcomer to our community today, um, it's good to have you with us. Just a reminder about phones, if you could just check that yours is switched off or on silent, that would be great. Today we're gathering and exploring the profound theme of called to community. We celebrate the divine call that invites us into deeper relationships with one another, that fosters a sense of mutuality and support, creating a place to belong. In a world that's so often marked by isolation and division, we come together in this place with these people to affirm our commitment to inclusivity, to compassion, and to shared purpose. Through music and song and prayer, reflection and companionship, we seek to embody the love and unity modelled by Jesus in his community of justice-seeking friends. We open our hearts and our minds to the transformative power of community as we journey together in faith and love. In the peace, in the presence, in the power, let us celebrate life in ourselves and in our world, life held in divine presence. We sing together, God whose love is ever with us.
In the silence of the moment of a time of prayer, we celebrate our common origin with everything that exists. We celebrate the mystery that some will call God, the ground and sustainer of all life, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We give thanks for the community in which this God is found and known. And in a moment of silence, we focus on breath, the breath that fills our lungs, the air that sustains our life, and the breath of God inspiring and filling our lives with meaning and hope. Holy Spirit, breath, life itself, you are never far, you are one with us. May our lives be open and our minds centred on you as we gather this day. And remembering Jesus, who taught his friends to pray, let us pray together. Gracious Spirit, who loves us unconditionally, whose realm is even now emerging among us and within us, we pray that your compassion guide us in every action. May we receive what we need for today and help us to be satisfied with the miracle of that alone. Forgiver, whose embrace brings us to wholeness, May we reconcile ourselves to one another with grace, and may we cancel the crushing debts that imprison our neighbours, so that communities of justice and joy may flourish. May we neither profit from nor ignore evil, but ever work to thwart it with non-violence, as we co-create the realm of peace in this world, now and each day. Amen. May the peace of divine presence be with you. I invite you to greet people sitting near you with gestures and words and smiles of peace. A reading from Ephesians, a letter to the early followers of Christ, probably written by a loyal disciple of St Paul's, to sum up his teaching and apply it to situations 20 or so years after his death. The author's language may seem incongruous to 21st century ears, but the message can be summed up as Christians get along with each other, maintain the unity which was accomplished in Christ. A reading from Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in Christ and in the strength of God's power. Put on the whole armour of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist 
and put on the breastplate of justice. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in spirit at all times, in all your prayers and petitions. Pray constantly and attentively for all God's people. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the good news, for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may have the courage to proclaim it as I ought. For the early Christ communities living out in faith in a changing world. The Gospel reading is from John, chapter 6, verses 56 to 69, with reference to the celebration of communion in the early Jesus communities. The community is reminded that the divine continually moves and works throughout and within humanity. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Abba God sent me, and I live because of Abba God, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus 
being aware that the disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the promised one ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you, that no one can come to me unless it is granted by Abba God. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered Jesus, To whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. For the call to embody Christ in community. The contemporary reading is Blessed Are Those That Gather by Glyn Cardi. Blessed are those that gather. No security check. No morality check. No financial check. Come as you are. Blessed are those that gather for breakfast on the beach. Ambience is everything. Everything is here needing you. Blessed are those that gather, engulfed by the aromas, by the eclectic tension of unconditional hospitality, available with all. Blessed are those that gather and discover the other, going by many names, closer than our breathing, so distant as our fears. God is the giver. God is the guest. God is the grace. God is the grub. God is gift. For wisdom that was in the beginning, for wisdom made known in poetry and song, for wisdom embodied among us.
in the name of the Spirit, calling us, comforting and challenging us, changing us. During this week, I had a meeting with um, Lyndall and Catherine, who are the chair and deputy chair of the Contact and Care Committee. We talked about lots of things to do with care in this community and the building up of community, but we got back, as we often do, to um, thinking about how we can encourage not just a sense of welcome in this place, but the creation of a place of belonging for people who come here seeking a spiritual home and a place to belong. And I told them the story um, that I had almost forgotten about um, from 2010. In 2010, I spent six months in Dayton, Ohio, um, as an extended study leave when I was the minister of St. Andrews on the Terrace in Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Data, uh, the Kettering Foundation um, was founded, it's a um, non-partisan research foundation, and it was founded in 1927 by Charles Kettering, who was the person who invented the electric starter motor um, that was used in the Ford Motor Company, so a very um, creative uh, person, and a problem solver. And today, Kettering as a research foundation works to inspire and connect individuals and organisations to advance thriving and inclusive democracies around the globe. And being based in the US, they've got their hands full trying to do this within their own country at the moment. When I went to Dayton, I thought, well, I need to find a church to belong to. And um, so I googled um, progressive church Dayton. Dayton is not generally a progressive city, it's a small Midwestern city, um, but sure enough, there was a church that was identifying, in fact, a couple identifying themselves as progressive, and one of them, Cross Creek Community Church, was really close to where I was living. So I attended the first service, and it was kind of a bit more, um, uh, there was a band, um, it was a bit of a different style of worship than I'm used to, but it was, um, the message was inclusive and progressive, and, and very welcoming. So I filled in the equivalent of the connecting card that we have in, in the pews um, in front of you. And during the week that followed, I received in the mail a little package and I opened it up and it was a bag of popcorn from Cross Creek Community Church with the message, thank you for popping in. It was a bit twee, um, but it was, heartfelt and it represented the ethos of the American Midwest. It might not work for us as we think about being welcoming and including of newcomers here at St Michael's in Melbourne. But I remember that as I began that six month study leave at Kettering, so far away from my family and my church community of St Andrews, a little bag of popcorn made me feel seen and welcomed. And it made me want to go back in the hope that I would find a community, a spiritual home for my sojourn. And I did, and I had some amazing experiences that were quite outside the box for my Protestant, sort of straight down the middle uh, way of experiencing church, including a baptism um, in the river, um, in, the, in the Ohio River, um, on Easter Sunday morning, um, a full immersion baptism. Not something that I've ever um, been part of um, in the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand. So popcorn was kind of fitting for the language of that down-to-earth Midwestern community, so different than my earlier experiences of the US when I spent 12 years in New York as a graduate student and teacher. But it was the message about welcoming and about including newcomers that was clear. And language does depend, it needs to change depending on our context. And so today, before, Marie, before I gave the readings to Marie to read, I wrote some little sentences about each reading because I was afraid that if you just heard them read baldly, you would focus on the things that um, perhaps are the jarring things and not be, not be able to hear some of the message within. So the jarring things like eating Jesus' body and blood and the militarism of putting on the armour of God. Sometimes when you read or hear biblical texts, they make perfect sense. It doesn't require a great deal of interpretation. And other times it's fairly easy to work it out. Um, but when I read the lectionary passages from Ephesians and John this morning, I didn't find that so much. 
This week's Gospel text is the third in a series of passages about bread in the lectionary. It's a very bread-intensive um, season, it seems. John chapter 6, 56 to 69 is a powerful passage where Jesus speaks about the necessity of abiding in him, but it can be quite challenging. Here Jesus presents a difficult teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which many of his disciples found hard to accept. But the passage highlights the importance of abiding in Jesus, and also about the challenges that come in living this way. So we need to say that Jesus' teaching here, the language that is used by John, is metaphorical, emphasizing the deep spiritual connection required of those who truly follow in the way of Jesus. And so the disciples, though, they grumbled and found this um, teaching offensive and a bit reminiscent of the way the Israelites grumbled against Moses. The metaphor of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood points not to something just yucky and cannibalistic. It points to the intimate and sustaining relationship that Jesus offers, similar to the nourishment provided necessary for life of food and drink. So the gospel uses this intimate but somewhat disturbing image of eating Jesus' own flesh. Numerous scholars have pondered about what it exactly means, and there are all sorts of complex theological things that I could share with you, but I decided to just keep it simple today and to suggest that it's simply a way of talking about personal commitment and about involvement in the Jesus movement. That is, this way of life this new way of life is so radical and so dependent on understanding Jesus as the one who will illuminate God's way that one must consume his very being in order to be part of the community. In the story of Jesus' life, this, this passage places Jesus at the crossroads and Jesus' disciples must decide whether to continue it, to follow him despite the difficult teachings he's offered. And this can mirror our own spiritual journeys when we face moments of doubt and decision. Faith, trust, is not a one-time choice, but a daily commitment to abide in Jesus, even when the path is hard. So the Gospel reading is part of John's Gospel message of giving us a clear understanding of how central is how central Jesus is to learning about God, to knowing God. In our modern context, abiding in Jesus means making daily choices that reflect our commitment to Jesus' teaching. It involves embracing difficult aspects of faith, such as loving our enemies, seeking justice, and living out the radical inclusivity of the gospel. Progressive Christian thought has emphasized these aspects, encouraging believers to live out our faith in ways that promote social justice, equality and compassion, and the spiritual practices that sustain these values. The passage that we heard from the Gospel also challenges us to deepen our relationship with Jesus and to make a daily commitment to abide in this way. And so the bread is the nourishing bread, living, breathing, dynamic bread that brings eternal life, which is fullness of life, life in all its fullness, abundance. So this means that Jesus is offering a relationship that moves and grows with the people of faith, which will sustain them into an unknown future. And the bread of life that nourishes is also a gift to us, but as a gift that invites a response from us, a commitment to getting know, to know those who are seen as other in our community and standing with them in solidarity when they are targeted for their difference. The reading from Ephesians focuses on an internal church community, an early church community, early Jesus community. Like the reading from John's Gospel, it is also not easy going. I don't like militaristic theology at the best of times, but in a time of war and empire building, 
and denial of climate change. It seems really inappropriate to consider Christian life in terms of military preparation. It's inevitable that we will hear the words in the gospel and in the letter to the church at Ephesus in the context of a world where war maims and kills and where the military industrial complex operates in a maelstrom of capitalist economics and neoliberal politics. Military industrial complex is a phrase that was coined by US President Dwight D. Eisenhower to describe the relationship between the military and the defense industry that supplies weapons, equipment, and services. The disastrous genocidal situation in Gaza, where over 40,000 people, whom almost all civilians have been killed by Israeli forces, is directly connected to the manufacture of weapons of war in the US, in Australia, and elsewhere. Militarism, in our context, just seems an obscene way to talk about preparation for Christian life. And we can say clearly that this metaphor doesn't speak to our time. As the introduction that Marie read before the Ephesians reading stated, the author of the letter to the Ephesians was probably not St. Paul, but more likely a loyal disciple of Paul's who was writing to sum up Paul's teaching and apply it to situations that were maybe 15 to 25 years after the death of Paul. But he writes in the voice of Paul. He writes in the voice of someone who's heard the stories and imbued in himself the sense of who Paul was and the centrality of his message. He writes knowing Paul's life story. And when we hear this jarring metaphor, it's worth remembering that Paul was quite often in bodily danger and found himself in prison more than once for the cause of Christ. His circumstances shaped his language, and his language could only make attempt, was an, an attempt to make sense of his circumstances. As Minister Candace Simpson wrote in her commentary for Inflesh.com, this is a quote, the passage was not written from the comfort of a writer's retreat sponsored by a major epistle publisher. Paul, she says, is likely stressed, exhausted, and experiencing great mental distress. He writes with urgency and with the language of war because he is quite actively engaged in a battle. Context changes the language that we must use to speak of our self-understanding, our understanding of our world, our struggles, and the struggles of the planet. For Paul, the rhetorical tools that he used were based on armor, the armor needed for protection in battle. But our world is different. Our frames of reference, our ways of imagining and naming the world are different. And we don't personify the devil, most of us. We don't believe that there is a human-like creature that operates through deceit and cunning wiles. But that aside, the writer of, of Ephesians knows the challenges that will be met by the people of God as they try to follow Christ are big challenges. And we face big challenges in our community, in our country. It's difficult to feed people when our food supplies are highly privatized and prices controlled by two large corporations. It's difficult to employ people when the devil, or in this case, advanced capitalism, necessarily requires a workforce that is overworked and underpaid. And it's difficult to house people when it is more financially profitable to keep luxury apartments empty. The issues that face us socially, these and many others, are more than fixing it with one or two people. And while we might hold the involved people accountable, we have to also account for the rulers and authorities who are the agents of evil in high places, as the Gospel reading said. In our case, we might think of the puppeteers who profit from the military-industrial complex in our time. 
and those who rape the earth through the mining of fossil fuels in the face of all that we know about the enormous risk of life, risk to life posed by the climate challenge crisis. So we're tasked as Christians, as progressive Christians in this community, to find other ways of speaking about the word of God and the way it illuminates our lives and the struggles and concerns that we share. So instead of speaking of arming ourselves, Candace Simpson suggests that rather than speaking of the word of God as the sword of the spirit, we could speak of the gift of the spirit. A gift that goes with us as we engage with the world around us, as we live in our families and in our church community. Paul was keenly aware of the powers that were operating in his time and place, aware of the empire's project to dissolve the radical movement called The Way. He had been imprisoned because he was one of many people proclaiming allegiance and loyalty to something other than the empire and its agents. Paul found ways to persuade people to, fort to fortify themselves for the journey. And his language might not persuade us, but we are free to engage with the ideas in this passage and find language that speaks to us, that resources us. We can still love the tradition and the texts, but it is clear that now is the time to find new language to strengthen us on our journey of liberation and love. So I'm going to suggest, as other writers that I've read have said, that it is now time to take off the armour of God and clothe ourselves in loose, flowing garments with garlands of flowers around our heads clothing that leaves it possible for us to move freely, but be open and vulnerable, and wearing shoes that will wing us on the way to peace. And as we embrace this kind of image of what we put on to live in the way of Jesus, we should remember too that it's not just about what we will do for others, but about sharing in community so that we, ex we are open to the gifts that others will share with us. It's about allowing others to do for us. It's about what we will receive. So I was going to think about inviting you just to think for a moment about anything that you've done recently that was hard or challenging. Who was in your corner? when you had to do that thing. As Paul offers a word of encouragement to the church, he also asks for prayer. And we can do that with one another. As we offer to others, we must also risk vulnerability and ask. Ask the people who come here often and be open to the people who have come more recently. Seek help, name, give, but also receive. So the metaphorical popcorn matters. What works in the American Midwest might not work here. We are considerably more sophisticated here in Melbourne. I don't know what we have to provide um, like a voucher for a latte, maybe get an offer of a company, because those are things that people in the city are looking for. But that sense of flagging that I see you, that you are welcome, that there is a place for you here, that we want you not just to attend, but to belong. This is what it is to be the church, so that we see the other, especially the other who is different, as we create and deepen community. The bread of life that nourishes is a gift to us, as it calls out of us a response, a commitment to getting to know others, to get, getting to know people who are seen as others, 
and standing with them in solidarity when they are targeted for their difference. But we can only do the work of justice when we are buoyed up and carried by the love and care of our people, our family, our friends, or our faith community. The reading that Marie concluded with was one that didn't need um, an introductory sentence because it comes from the 21st century, from Glyn Cardi, who is a minister in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I want to remind us of that blessed are those who gather, because I think that is what those threads of the biblical text that we heard bring us to, to our gathering together. So sort of starting in the middle of Glyn's blessing. Blessed are those that gather, engulfed by the aromas, by the eclectic tension of unconditional hospitality, available with all. Blessed are those that gather and discover the other, going by many names, closer than our breathing, as distant as our fears. God is the giver, God is the guest, God is the grace, God is the grub, God is gift. So we say, God bless the world we love, stranger and friend. Go before us, restore us with a hope that cannot end. Every people, every nation, mighty ocean, heaven's dome. God bless the world we love, our only home. God bless the world you love, our only home. Amen. prayers of the people in thanksgiving and solidarity. Let us pray. We come in prayer that we may be moved beyond our own preoccupations to respond with love and action. 
as we contemplate the mystery of abiding in the Spirit of Christ and Christ in us, we are reminded of our call to live in true community. In this congregation, may we use the time we share to build strong and meaningful relationships that reflect divine love. Grant us the spirit of hospitality that we may be open in our hearts to others, creating relationships of welcome and warmth. And may we work together for the common good, supporting one another through life's challenges, offering emotional, spiritual, and practical help. And we pray for the church, both gathered in this congregation and worldwide, as it shares the gospel of life and love. May it be a voice for the marginalized and oppressed, offering the embrace of welcome to all people. We pray for our nation and for all nations. May our leaders not seek their own power and fortune, but truly have a vision for a world in which the poor are cared for and where no one is left behind. We pray for all the places where war and violence disrupt human and planetary community. We especially lift up the people of Gaza, praying for peace and the restoration of communities, for a ceasefire that will lead to the safe return of Israeli hostages. We also pray today for people who experience gender-based violence. May they find love and protection and community, and through that, the strength and courage to seek help and healing. Help us to stand against all forms of violence and discrimination, promoting justice, equality, and safety for all. And we pray for the whole creation all life on this earth and the whole amazing universe. May we learn to attend to and care for creation and to make changes in our own lives for the sake of the planet. And in a time of silence, we pray for the needs of the world, for those that we know and love and for ourselves. Open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts, O Holy One, that we may embrace the hope to which we are called. Amen. Our sacred texts invite us to pray for one another. So in this time of sharing our offering, we bless each other in word and in action, calling for each other's liberation and gathering our resources that it may be so. So let us share our offerings, our material prayers for the flourishing of community.
as we bless these offerings brought to the table and the gifts that are given in other ways, let us pray together. We pray for one another, O God of tenderness. We desire deeply one another's safety, joy, wellness and rest. Bless our offerings and our words toward our love for each other, that out of this love a more compassionate world may be born. Amen. And I just wanted to add a word about my, um, my annual leave, and that's to say that um, I'll be back the week before St Michael's Day um, because that's going to require a bit more preparation, but I've had a wonderful conversation already with the Church Services Committee, and the theme for St Michael's Day is peace in our hearts and peace in our land. Uh, so we're looking forward to that service and to the beautiful music that will be part of it and to a shared meal that will follow it on the 22nd of September. I also uh, want to remind you that the um, Sundays in September are part of the season of creation and David Dawes, who will be taking the three services while I'm away, is very aware of this and will be threading the themes of creation care through the services and we'll be working with the Environmental Action Group on a something special that is going to happen on the third of those three Sundays. So I'm sorry that I'm going to miss that, but look forward um, to hearing about the sharing of the season of creation, which has become part of our life here at St Michael's. So let us sing together, Community of Christ. Go from here covered in the love of God, clothed in the love of community, and may courage and faith accompany you, and hope encircle you like a garland of flowers upon your head. Amen.